You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome to a special edition secret tape. Tom and Fran yeah. are on the road. I'm Fran. And I'm Tom. And this is the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast. Yeah, and uh, and like we said, we're on the road, and we wanted to bring you an hour's drive from uh, from northern Delaware to uh, central New Jersey of the license plate game. I'm going to start with Georgia. <laughs> this is Georgia. I saw an Indiana a couple miles back. Tons of that, New, oh, New York. A, up we got there. a Maryland over here. All right. Tons of Delaware. Delaware. I saw Pennsylvania. Um, we'll, we'll keep everyone posted as we see more. Because, we, ha- uh, we have everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're all set. There's an Indiana. Yeah. We're also in quite a bit of traffic. Ooh, what's South Carolina? Look at that. So that's a fun start. But, um, we do <laughs> want to talk about our day. We're actually coming back from, uh, the Mount Cuba center where we were just talking with, uh, Sam Hoadley and, uh, and Laura, who's the assistant trial gardens manager and, who else was there? We had Alon, we had Ellen, and Nate, who Nate, Nate has also been on the, the podcast. He's their natural lands manager. And uh, got to have a nice lunch with them. And just kind of uh, Sam and Laura gave us a tour around, and we talked a lot about the trial gardens, and uh, <laughs> which turned into a lot of looking at plants, but a lot of talking about native plant philosophy as well. Yeah, yeah. And it was just a really fun day. One, one of the things I appreciated was just that – we had really good conversations about how we can help each other and how we can work together and how. Oh, what's that one, friend? Is that Ohio? Uh, I. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. My I'm eyesight thinking, was better. I think I it was Ohio. You. I'm going to count it as Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> um, just how we can work together. Yeah. And how the work that they're doing and the work that we're doing can help each other. And that was a fantastic talk about um, getting native plants in the hands of people, especially. Uh, after you see results of the trial gardens mm-hmm. and some of these plants aren't commercially available and uh, trying to get a, a head start or a jump start on that. Yeah, we had Sam on a couple months ago uh, talking about, oh, there's a West Virginia. Uh, this is this license plate game is really going to be interrupted yeah. to what we're doing. Um, oh, what's that? Is that New York up to the right? That's New York, New York over there. Oh. Is that someone? Yeah, I, yeah, I should accept this All one. right, let me pause this. We are back and I saw Virginia and Maryland. Okay, we didn't have Virginia. We had Maryland, and uh, and we just crossed into New Jersey. Um, there was uh, yeah, I got an emergency phone call. My brother was visiting another nursery and forgot his wallet. So <laughs> so yeah, he, I had to call him and turn around because the, the the president of that nursery didn't have his direct phone number. So all right, now uh, do you yeah. remember what we were talking about? Yeah, we were talking about Mount Cuba's trial gardens. Yes. Um, I don't know if we got into the trial gardens yet. We were talking well, about how we could work together. Yes. Um, yeah. And I and who was there at the mm-hmm. time? Yeah. Um, but one of the things I felt walking around, one, how beautiful. Yeah. Of a location this is, and if you're, if you're interested, in, now not everything is is full street species native, but if you're looking on how to incorporate incorporate natives into a garden setting, man, what a perfect example. Yeah. Exactly. Of, of how you can do that. And how many native plants I don't even think about. Mm-hmm. And what we got to see today, uh, and Fran, you, you said you hadn't been there since before it actually opened to the yeah, public. It was the, it was the mid-90s. Um, well, I, and I hadn't seen this yet, or very much of it, but you have the, the naturalistic gardens, which are more wooded and still show you how you can use native plants and have like a really naturalistic look to those gardens. What you didn't get to see, but you'll get to see next month when we go up to their, their party, is um, is the formal gardens around the house and Which how I they're using see, native yeah. plants in that kind of style. So, again, this is, I put it as a, a native plant uh, destination. Um, no matter where you are, I, really in the country, it would be interesting to see this place. But uh, especially if you're in the eastern half of the U.S., You'll be able to, like east of the Mississippi, you'll be able to see, hey, this is how I could use native plants at home and have something that, whether it's more formal or naturalistic, this is how I can use them. Here's some of the stuff I can pair together. These are how, realistically, native plant experts are using these plants 
to have something that mixes beauty and ecology. Again, not just species native plants, but also some some cultivar selections uh, as well. But how you can use them in a, a garden setting. So and at uh, mature sizes. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. And, and and seeing them in a way, some of these plants that I've never seen them before mm -hmm. uh, in, in that kind of setting. But yeah. and how many native plants I just didn't know. Oh, you yeah. know, I was playing yeah. the game in my head, well and I don't know if you were doing it. And Sam is so knowledgeable, mm -hmm. but as we're walking by plants, I'm like, I think this is this, and I have a feeling this might be, th and then he'd say, and I was like, wrong on that one. Yep. <laughs> okay, yeah. right on this one. I was right on this one, or I'd yeah. see a sign, but I was only that maybe 60%. Yeah, I, I tried to ask on a couple of them um, just to see if I was right, and, and really it's through a native plant every day. There's so many plants that we're, we're faced with there that we don't know or we've never seen before. And we so saw I'll, one that we didn't know existed. Yeah. The false goat here, which yeah, our yeah. producer, after I, if you don't listen to a native plant every day, I teased her for saying that a certain native plant, a companion plant to it was a stilby. And I mocked her that they're, why are you using non-natives as a companion yeah, plant? Yeah. And then she surprised us with a native a, zil, a still be. Yep. And obviously we were stumped because we didn't know yeah, it. Existed. And then we got to see it today. Um, yes. Not blooming yet, but uh, still you could kind of see the, the flower stalk was starting to form. So you kind of see what it was going to look like. And it's pretty cool so far. But uh, yeah, some of like when we're faced with that or say, um, still be by Panada. Oh, I don't remember. I think That's, so. But uh, oh, good to but so we see plants there, and then I like when we're talking about them, I'd look them up just to see what they look like. And even at the end of our, our uh, meet the guest episodes, they throw out their favorite native plant. There's tons of stuff I haven't heard of, so I would Google it. Like we were saying, Shannon Trimboli had, uh, had said her favorite native plant was cup plant, which I've never seen before, other than in a picture from when yeah. she talked about it. And I saw something that kind of looked like what the picture resembled, and I said, is that cup plant? And they're like, no, no, that's, uh, I don't remember. I think it was some kind of lily. And um, and then I said, but we have cup plant right down here. So <laughs> then I got to see it. And uh, so, yeah, I did some of that when, when we were walking around. And I didn't want to look like too much of a doofus and ask it on all these different plants that I've seen pictures of or, or kind of had an idea of what they might look like, even though I didn't see them before. Um, but I got, I got um, uh, Baptisia alba, right? Which is the yeah. white Baptisia, or what's that? White is it? White false indigo? I think so. Is the yeah. the botanical name for it? So I got that one right, um, which was good. I that's a, probably a pretty easy one. Um, I'm trying to remember this is one of the other ones I got right. Did not get coupled right clearly. But. No, but there were a few, and there were a few that we talked about that you hadn't seen, like uh, dog hobble. Yeah, they had dog oh, hobble yeah. there, so you got to see it mature. Yep. Uh, cool. And we got to see a native Stewardia, which I'd never mm -hmm. seen in person. So it was, I, I mean, it was almost like a walk of wonders. With, yeah. Oh, look, pitcher plants. Oh, look, yeah. uh, lady slippers. Oh, look, you know, it was everything you wish you'd see, you'd, you'd turn the corner and you wouldn't see it. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty And amazing. it was funny because right when we entered the, the one meadow, I was like, as Sam is like saying, oh, and this is this plant and this is this plant that I haven't heard of and another plant I haven't heard of and another <laughs> plant I've never heard of. And I'm like, man, I really don't know my plants. I'm getting like that Charlie Brown, doo -doo 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 -doo, like feeling sorry for myself. That I, but I'm like, but I still know way more plants than my wife knows. <laughs> like, I should bring her here and then I can do what Sam is doing to me. <laughs> but um, well, you could just make stuff up yeah. and she wouldn't know. I wouldn't have to. I knew enough that I could, I could get by. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really fun being around people who are so much more knowledgeable about plants in their environment than I am. And, uh, and, I, I, and our educators. Yeah, and educators in that fact. And I always forget about it. It's like when um, when we tour people around the nursery or around our seed fields, and it's like, we know what everything is. Less probably because we can recognize it, but more because we know what's there. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I go, oh, I'm walking through the seed field. I know this is... This is uh, like New England Aster because I walked by it a ton and I've seen the sign there. It's not necessarily because I recognize it. I just knew that's where it was. Well, and, it's um, easy to narrow it down because we know what's on the property. Exactly. So, yeah. and so you know, And you'll have people say, oh, is that this? And it's like, no, no, that's New England Aster. Like I knew it. But uh, it's so, yeah, it, it, it comes with uh, your home turf.
nerf, I think, a little bit too. When you know what's there and what to look for in certain places, it makes it a little bit easier for you. But um, we shouldn't sell ourselves short. We still know a lot of native plants, friend. Exactly. But the we one of the highlights where we we went spent a good amount of time in the trial gardens. Yes. Yeah. Um, which you've seen before. It was my first time uh, visiting the trial gardens, um, and we got to see. Obviously, trial gardens of years past yep. and future to come and get a glimpse of what was performing well and yeah. what wasn't oh, yeah. performing well. And we actually had some really good discussions as far as framing results. Yes. Um, you know, just because that these conditions that they're being trialed in aren't natural conditions for some of these plants, mm -hmm. but... They are garden conditions, and they're being trialed as garden plants. Yeah, um, not for naturalization purposes. So it was just, so you know, one of the the perfect examples that we took, we were looking at ironweed, mm -hmm. and um, I guess one of the better performing plants is a native, but not from this area. It's a southeastern native, and it was performing very well. And a lot of the ones that were native to Delaware, where the gardens were at, weren't performing well, but they also weren't in their ideal conditions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, naturally, they, they're they a facultative wet species. They like it a little more moist. They like shaded roots. They like to be part of a community, and that's not what they were getting. Uh, they had space. It was open sun. It was on the drier side. Yeah. They're, they're to the elements. We're also in... A, a drought. Yeah. But I would shouldn't say we're in a drought. We're in if, what feels like drought like conditions. We haven't had rain in a long time. Um, um, a lot of the East Coast. And uh, and if you can just walking around, you can feel how dry the, the soil is. And that was the same case. Well, one of our conversations earlier is they're trying to high, or, uh, showcase these plants in normal garden conditions where a lot of people aren't irrigating. So they're trying not to irrigate, but they're trying to weigh, hey, we need to irrigate this just so it's not a total loss, yeah. and uh, and we have some results at the, the end of some of these trials, or because if we don't, we might lose entire plots, um, ironweed being, being something that needs a little bit more moisture in the soil. Uh, so that was one of the ones that they were really saying, hey, we might want to water this just so we can make sure we have results at the end, even though it's not replicating exactly the conditions that we wanted. Um, yeah, and th and that's a difficult decision to make because I right. don't think they've had to make that decision. Yeah. But you know, going back to the ironweed, one of one of the concerns was we don't want to say that, say, Vernonia nova borsensis, which is New York ironweed, which is native to the area, is a bad plant just because it's not performing well. Because mm -hmm. it's not just in these conditions. Yeah, it's not performing as well as others. So it's it's more like, hey, this is, and they did it with the carrots. It's almost like a, a customizable spreadsheet. Like these are ones that like it more wet. These are ones that like it mm -hmm. on the drier side. These, you know, and you can say, hey, maybe if you had it in these conditions, or if these are the conditions you had, these are the ones that might perform yeah. better. Oh yeah. So it's it's one thing to to take with a grain of salt when you're looking at it, just how to yeah. do that. So yeah, and the, the trial gardens as a whole are just really interesting. It's it's really good research. And uh, in my my younger years, when I would look at Mount Cuba, and uh, I didn't uh, really care for for cultivars, I was like, oh, why are we really doing this? It's not. It's the the answer is you need to plant just the species native plants. Don't mess with the cultivars. Don't mess with all this other stuff. Um, this is. In my opinion, at that time, was uh, the the testing was um, I don't want to say useless. So I'll say misguided. <laughs> yeah. but, but I probably felt like it was you know we're we're going the wrong direction. We don't need to test all these cultivars. We need to test uh, the species plants and and maybe test the ecotype and and maybe that's what we need to look at less so uh, or more so than than uh, cultivars. But after talking to Sam, or getting to know Sam first, yeah. and talking to him about some stuff, um, and then now having, uh, forming a friendship with him and a lot of the folks at Mount Cuba, and 
having him on the podcast a few times. I don't want to say I've done a complete 180, but when it comes to garden worthiness of native plants, I agree now that cultivars do have a place and what they're doing is really important. And I think it's something that should be tested and, and probably is being tested to some extent across the country. It's uh, because they're what they have represents what's really good in the mid Atlantic, but that might be different in Texas or in Chicago or, or something like that. And that was a conversation that we had yeah. that it would be great if there were other places in the country trialing the same plants mm -hmm. at the same time. And they're yeah. even, they may have the same plant, but two different ecotypes yeah. that yeah. they're testing. Um, you know, otherwise, listen, you can have all the opinions you want, but unless you do these tests, it's all speculation mm -hmm. of what you think. So it's nice to see that this work is being done, what they're seeing pollinator. We had so many interesting conversations. One of the trials is Amsonian, which, mm -hmm. uh, we talk about Hubrechtii a lot, which is really only native, I think, in two states. Um, so they were saying the pollinator value of what they were seeing, they didn't see a lot of pollinators. But also the pollinators that use that plant may not be present in this area. It yeah. might be a specialist poll uh, pollinator that's only if, only available yeah. in Arkansas, you yeah. know, where, yeah. where they're native. So it's... Or they it, said uh, they aren't really seeing if there's something that's coming in at night, night. Yeah, night and which to which i said moth night we're having a moth <laughs> night i know a guy we're all gonna come down and uh and, and do this and um so blaine if you're listening to this i just volunteered your services uh <laughs> but yeah it's a uh, and that was in like when you're looking at pollinator value and, and that one they said had less than some of the other species they test that's yeah it's a plant that's out of its Traditional Natural native range. range, yeah. So yeah, no, there's a, but going back, like they're measuring garden worthiness, and you think about native plants on the wider scale. Um, your garden usually isn't a natural condition, and um, especially a first time or, or a more novice native plant purchaser, and uh, they're wanted. They're saying, "Hey, you know what? I'm hearing about native plants. They're good for the ecosystem. They're good for the environment," and they go out. And, and buy a native plant, you want to get something that's going to be a little bit more consistent. They're going to have consistent results. Uh, someone who's new to this, they're, they're used to traditional plant buying, where it's like, hey, I'm going to buy this plant, it's going to get to be this tall, it's going to be this color, and, um, and it's going to bloom at this time. And you get that with a cultivar. Sometimes with the species, some and it differs from species to species, but sometimes when you buy a species plant, you don't necessarily know exactly what you're going to get. The bloom time may be slightly different. The color may be slightly different. Sometimes it could be completely different. With uh, with um, some of the stuff we've seen, hey, it's typically purple, but sometimes it's white, and <laughs> sometimes it's pink. And um, if you're buying a, an echinacea, is what I and you're getting a, a, a cultivar of echinacea. You know when you plant it, it's going to be exactly what the picture on the label looks like. If you were to buy a, one of our echinacea, you may have some that have pointy cones and droopy petals. You may have some that have petals that point up and have really flat cones. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's, that's, that's really genetic thing. diversity. There's yeah. genetic diversity. But when you're planting one or three, the genetic diversity, especially to a novice, they may say, well, this didn't live up to my expectations, and that's enough to get off the wagon. So that's where I, I find a lot of value in these trials, where I used to not. I used to, like I said, I used to think they were a little silly. But now I look at them and say, there's a lot of value here because those people who are just getting on the bus, and that's that, what they need to see. They that, need to have that consistency and know if I was buying a microwave, and I'm, hey, I'm buying the stainless steel microwave with the white buttons, and it, it's going to do these five things. That's what you need for that first person. You need that. They know exactly what they're going to get. And as they get more and more into it, then they can experiment a little bit more. And they'll get more excited and say, hey, you know what? I really want to try this because there's some genetic diversity there. And I think it opens the door. I agree. One of the, the key factors that we talked about is that if you want to get more people to think native, 
their first experience, they have to have success. Yes. Yep. And if that success comes by way of cultivar or by way of these trials where someone could say this was highly rated, it works good in the garden, I'm going to plant it, they find it, they plant it, and it works. That's a win. Mm-hmm. That's a win. That's that's the first step on that journey. And we didn't narrow it up to someone and made it so difficult. Like, no, you can only use species, and it has to be from this eco region. And listen, all of those in a perfect world, Tom and I agree we would go that route. 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. Yep. But if you have someone that's just dipping their toe in the water and you think it's so complex that they give up, mm-hmm. you lost. Yeah. And if if the trials and the cultivars are that gateway to get someone to open the door, I'm behind it 100%. Yeah. I think about it with, uh, like, I, I like the fish. So if you're taking a little kid out fishing the first time, you don't take them on some uh some to go for like some rare yeah you don't take them on a tuna charter where you may not catch anything and you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time and and you may you don't have guaranteed success you take them to the local pond with a a hook and bobber and a can of worms and and you're gonna try and catch sunnies and bluegills yeah because you want them to have guaranteed success they're gonna catch something and they're gonna feel that that's instant success um, there's something about, I don't know, with little kids when they catch that first fish, that excitement they have, and then you get them, like, well, I guess this is a play on words, but you have them hooked. They're, they're into fishing at that point. I think the same, that's an analogy for what we need to do with people when they're getting introduced to native plants. You can't have them looking for that native astilbe and saying, this is what you really want, and then it's got to be a local ecotype, and it's got to be... Like chasing, like again, they're chasing that white whale, and then hoping it's the right, it's gonna work in their their garden. You need a, an easy win, so they're like, "Hey, this is really cool. I'm helping the environment. It's giving back. Is it the best pollinator plant? Maybe not, but it's better than a, a barberry, or it's better than a English ivy, or something that's not giving back in any way." So, and when the work that they're doing is so important for us because it's work that we can't do they're yeah. they're doing the legwork they're creating a buzz and market for native plants that didn't exist a bit the day the results came out for the carex trials we had like five phone calls for carex woody eye i had never even heard of it before but it performed so well that people were like i need to have this plant now because the plant really wasn't commercially available anywhere, that hurts a little bit. And that's something that we talked about today, just yeah. working, saying, hey, these are ones we know are performing well. Do you want to get these into production? Is this something that you would think about carrying so that when the results come out, there's mm-hmm. there's plants available? Because uh, we talked about one of the trials that's been going on for 10 years and the plant's aren't commercially available. Yeah, they, they were saying that's one of the challenges with with these trials is when they start the trial, uh, typically by the time the results come out, it's it's five to 10 years later. So they may start the trial and it's not that necessarily that, a, they have a wide range of uh, species and cultivars for uh, like ec- their echinacea trial. They had echinacea purpurea, pallida, I think they had a couple other echinaceas and then different cultivars of all those echinaceas as well. And then from there, uh, well, basically what they were saying is, oh, this is one that was a lesser known cultivar at the time, performs really, really well in the trial. We were able to find a source for it when we bought it. Uh, since then, it got taken out of production. No one grows it. And it just came out as like a top three plant in our, our trials report. And you can't find it anywhere because no one was selling it. No one, like there was no market for that plant at the time. And they just created one and now it's gone. So that was where, uh, where they approach not just us but a lot of other uh, native plant focused nurseries in the area to kind of say hey let's when we have these reports or come out we want again we want people to have that feeling success we did all this research it comes out hey here's the plants that you should consider for for your native plant garden um, whether it's at your home or or for a different use now you got you're going to go to your local native plant nursery 
or uh, or your your garden center, and you have something to ask for. If it's not there, you have that that feeling of failure. It's like, oh, I can't find this anywhere. So, what good does it do me that I know this is the best carrots that I want, or the carrots I want yeah. to plant based off the report? Okay. So, it's they want to have people to be successful. So, we get a little early glimpse into what they're having success with, and saying, "Hey, why don't you take this and start uh, start growing it so that when we release this report, and like we said, people called for the carrots. What do I?" The first, the day the report came out, we had a bunch of phone calls. Now, when the next report comes out, whether or I forget which one is next, people are going to call up and say, hey, this is the ironweed I want, or this is the goldenrod I want. And it's like, well, okay, yeah, we have some. Yeah. So, the One of the things I appreciate, especially at the research, is that they have revisited some plants that they had done before. They've done echinacea twice, mm-hmm. and they actually... Hey, it's it's been ten years. There's a bunch of new cultivars. Let's take the top five performing ones from the last one. Let's add the new ones in, and let's see what happens. And it's you know, on that one, most of the top performers for from the first trial were the top performers from the second trial. The other thing that I appreciate that they've started to do was keep the top performers at the trial garden, so you can come back and see top performers from past trials which I don't think was always the case. They used to take them out eventually and keep circling. So if you want to see the top performers from the Carrick's trial, you can go back and see them. You can you can get a glimpse yeah, of it. Yeah. But it was pretty interesting just seeing like the goldenrod. There was one where there were a species and there was a cultivar next to it. And it was kind of exciting to see the species outperforming the cultivar. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. like, "Wow, why would you get the species? Look at the native. It looks so. It's pretty. It's yeah. Oh yeah. Why would you get the cultivar? Look yeah. at the look at how the, the species, species is going. Like, it was so exciting to see that instance. Like, oh yeah, it was right the first time. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. And I think that from looking at their their um, their trials reports in the past, you found the species of plants. Maybe they weren't always number one. But they typically ended up being in that like top three or four. Um, I remember with the echinacea trial, their their local ecotype species plant was I think second, and there there was a cultivar that did a little better, but uh, or that one might have been a little different. I know well Minarda uh, did them, which was um is the scarlet bee bomb. That was one where they had one single cultivar did significantly better than the rest of the pack. And then uh, in, in attracting pollinators in addition to just how well it grew in that garden environment. And I think the species was second, but it was well behind in pollinator attractiveness to uh, to the, that one cultivar, which was Jacob Klein. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's valuable insight. And not like it's, again, it's not copy and paste across the, the East Coast, but hey, you know what? If you're in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, eh, that might be true there as well. So it's um, there's a lot of really, really good research that's coming out of there. Uh, we were really honored to to be able to go down there and have these conversations and and just and it was it's we could have spent so much more time there. It was so hard. Like it, we were so busy while we were there. It was it it was really hard because we wanted. Like every now and then, I had to take my attention away from it, yeah. and it bothered yeah. me that I had to do that. And I wanted to stay longer than how we stayed. Yeah. Um, so that was just uh, like again, just promoting Mount Cuba and saying, and we still haven't got to see the natural lands with uh, with Nate has to walk us around there. Um, Fran, uh, you still have to see the the top gardens up there. But if yeah. like again, if you're, I don't want to just say if you're in the area, uh, go it's a go there. I think if you're from uh from Tennessee, uh, maybe in the Nashville area, and you want to take a trip to to the Mid Atlantic, that's a place. And you're and you're interested in native plants, that's like a must stop. And there's a whole bunch of public gardens in in that area. There's um, Longwood, there's Winter, there's Chanticleer. But we we're talking about Stonely today. Stonely, yeah, yeah. There's a whole bunch of uh, and some of them have a lot of native plant focus there. So there's a whole bunch if you're just into plants as a whole. And, to see in that area. But. We were talking about just foot traffic, and they were saying that foot traffic is way up this year. And I think that's a, a, a 
a good portion of that is just post COVID people saying we're we're going out like we're we're experiencing this. But Mount Mount Cuba isn't. It's not like off a main throughway like Longwood Gardens is. Yeah. It's off. The, you're not going to just accidentally drive by. I mean, it's a destination. Put it on your map. You really have to go. Like I'm really upset. I haven't been back since the mid '90s. Went to, before it was open, so it's different. But I, 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 I'll be back soon. I'll, I'll be back. Well, we're obviously going to the the trial garden. Yeah. Yeah. dinner but i'll i'll be back besides that yeah spend the day. i was just thinking for him maybe we start a new series and it can be be uh be like driver's dives and science and dives <laughs> with guy 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 uh fietti. fietti and um i'm trying to think of a good name on the fly here but i can't Ooh. or we can just go to different different gardens <laughs> and be like that's rocket man that's the bomb <laughs> <laughs> take me to flavor <laughs> <laughs> what a good, what's a good way instead of flavor town? Take, take me to Pollock Town. I can uh, bleach my hair and uh, grow out of Fu Manchu. There you go. And, uh, I already have the build for it, so. <laughs> <laughs> take me to Pollock Town. Buzz! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, it's, uh, that's like, again, it's a. It's a, if you're into native plants and you're east of the Mississippi, I would say that's like a must-see destination. Oh, totally. It's, um, totally. And again, we aren't, we're a little uncultured where it comes to botanical gardens uh, in, in other areas of the country, but uh, well, hey, we're spoiled here. Why would we go anywhere? All right, well, let's, it, other than that, it's, it's near Kennett Square, PA, which mm-hmm. is the mushroom capital of I don't know if it's the world. I think it might it's be the world, world, at least com- North, or at least the U.S. In the U.S., mushroom yeah. capital of the U.S. So, if you're interested in a wide variety of mushrooms, mm-hmm. uh, you'll you'll know when you're close because you'll smell it. Yeah, I used to play softball. We, softball. we should clarify: this is like uh, edible mushrooms that yeah. you're going to go at the grocery uh, store. Oh and yeah, get. not magic yes. mushrooms. Sorry. <laughs> <That's>, the, <laughs> but I used to play softball yeah. behind a major mushroom factory. Oh my lord. It was hard, like mm-hmm. smell wise, uh, to but, do it. Uh, yeah, and I know a lot of these mushroom farms have uh, have like retail stores, like how you're. you're yeah. uh, Phillips, I think wherever I think you are, the Phillips mushroom is one of the. Um, is that it? I'm trying to remember the one that we Phillips. went to, but uh, yeah, you, you'll be driving along and there's a, a mushroom farm, and like there might be a, a produce stand at the your local farm. They just have a, a little walk-in store where you can buy maitake mushrooms or, or baby portobellos or, like, you can buy all the different mushrooms. you would A lot of them you'd see in the grocery store, but you're buying it direct from the producer, uh, typically at a pretty significant discount, and they are as fresh as you're going to get because they were probably usually cut, like, that morning. Yeah, and, so. like, not only that, natural lands, like, they're chest land preserved. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of preserved uh, natural land, like, I think where... I can't, it's like Stargazer Rock where they drew up the Mason Dixon line. Mm-hmm. It's right in that Brandywine Valley. There's the uh, Brandywine River Museum. If you're into MC Wyeth or Andrew Wyeth, any of the Wyeth family, the Brandywine Battlefield is right there. Um, and also you can go kayaking or canoeing down the Brandywine, which is yeah. uh, a beautiful, beautiful, I, I've canoed it. I've kayaked it and I've tooted it, so it's it's a great day. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's yeah, it's a very very interesting area. And then if you're a, a plant lover, uh, and then more specifically a native plant lover, uh, it's just a great place to to visit. And um, it's, it's something I wish we took more advantage of because uh, we're so very close. And it's just uh, it's just far enough away. It's not like you're making a day trip out of it. You aren't going for a quick jaunt down there. And one of the conversations we had on the way there was the topography Yeah, is very much like if you didn't know, and, and even Sam was saying it, like if you didn't know and someone just dropped you there, you could you could either think, oh, I'm in Connecticut or, oh, I'm in like North Carolina, but not not Pennsylvania, not this part of Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's really interesting, like rolling hills and just... Tom and I were both saying, it's like, wow, I, I kind of miss this 
this whole landscape and topography. Yeah, yeah. Where we are is, uh, and flat. now that we're back in New Jersey driving wise, uh, it's very flat. And um, I well, our one farm is uh, on Mount Pleasant Road. I live on Mount Pleasant Road, and um, I think Mount Pleasant has a, a height of like ninety feet above sea level <laughs> compared to our town, which is is uh, it's probably like 72 feet above sea level. Yeah. It, maybe it's a little over 100 feet above sea level, though, the Mount of Mount Pleasant. But it's the one of the highest points in the, probably in our entire county. Probably. And, What's uh, that, Arnie's Mount, I think. It's Arnie's Mount is probably the highest point. But uh, And it's like, yeah, it's a little hill. And if when you're driving from, um, like, from my house to our farm that's out that way, you, you might not even recognize that you went uphill in the mile, yeah. a mile and a half. Going up Mount Pleasant, I don't and then you're going there, and you're going up and down and around, and it, it's not mountainous by any means, but it's uh, little narrow roads and and just these probably just whatever's just past rolling hills. I think is the landscape there. Yeah, I would say where we're at seems flat until you bike it. If you've ever had to like <laughs> yeah, bike right. like Sykesville right. Road, I'm like, why does it feel like regardless which way you're going, yeah. you're biking uphill? You know, that's when. You realize, all right, maybe it's not as flat as I thought it was, but it's not rolling hills at all. Yes, yeah. You know, it's like slants. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Mild slants that go on forever. But, no, it's – this was – I realized how important it is. It's very difficult. We, it's June 1st right now. You're probably not going to hear this until mid-July, mm-hmm. I, I think, when, when Tom and I are both on vacation. But how important it is for us to get out sometimes – and see yeah. these things, how like reinvigorated I get, especially during the busy time of the year. And it was very difficult for Tom and I to get out today yeah. Oh, yeah. to do this. But once you're there, you realize how important it is and how how much of a great day we have. I'm, I'm really excited just having left. Oh, there. yeah, me too. It's um, I, I literally, when we're leaving, I'm like, I got to find a way to get my whole family back out here this weekend. Uh, that's kind of what I'm, I'm planning to do. And the other thing I'll, I'll make a note of too is it's a, now it's a Thursday. We're there most or a lot of the day. Um, and while the parking lot seemed relatively full, we really didn't see a lot of people out. around the pond area. It was, yeah, yeah. Around the pond, you had some people sitting on or, benches or and it yeah. was never very loud. Um, no. and you know, I, I remember trips to Longwood gardens where, uh, there was times where you got jammed up in little traffic jams of people, especially around the conservatory or or the more uh, the bigger attractions there. That didn't really happen. No. It, like or I, any time I've been there at Mount Cuba, I've never really had that. And I, Sam was even saying on the the weekends, um, well, it's more crowded. It's not like it's that crowded. And um, and he was even he had worked at Longwood in the past. And he was joking. Joking around, saying, "Oh yeah, that we'll get really excited uh, because it's like, wow, there's 250 people here today." And he's like, "That was like a rainy Tuesday afternoon at, at Longwood." <laughs> and and um, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a really cool place. I think it's um, even for those that have, may have some uh, mobility challenges, uh, there are places that you can see there. Uh, fairly easily. There's some trails that we went on that were that were pretty steep, but um, but uh, so I th- I think it's probably pretty accessible for most, but but maybe not all. What what was a plant that stood out to you today? Oh gosh, that I don't remember what it was called. <laughs> that the tree that I kind of referenced before that the white flowers, the, the bluish pollen that was, but I don't remember what that was called. Oh, that was the. Uh... The Stewardia. Okay. That that was, it's like native to the southeast, which yeah, yeah. it almost had a flower because the flowers will start. It was a very wide open mm-hmm. flower. Um, almost like imagine like a white. Um, was it like what is the vine? Passion. Like passion, passion flower. flower. Yeah. Like imagine yeah. a white passion flower. Yeah. Kind of reminded me of that. that. Um, but from far away, as those flowers were starting to melt and get old, it reminded me of a dove tree, a Davidia. Um, obviously not that big, but it has such great branching structure. Um, I don't know. There was something about being under that tree, it seems, that yeah. the, the structure was very awesome. Uh, we saw so many cool things, striped maple and uh, 
to some things that aren't as common. One thing that stood out to me was, and they said it wasn't really being done as a trial, but behind the trial gardens, there's a lot of trellises with native clematis and, and some non-native clematis. Um, some of those flowers, like the one had a bud that was like a blue and yellow bud that opened up. Yeah. Like I'm watching the pollinators go crazy. Um, that one really stood out to me. Like I was like, oh, this is oh, this yeah. is really fascinating. I, I I just didn't even think about putting this in my conversation. Yeah. With you. And and Sam and Laura were really saying it's something that's that just that area. It's not. It's not necessarily out of the way, but it's um it's easy to overlook. Yes. And, uh, no, that was really, really interesting. And they said, they were telling us a lot of those plants actually came to them from Dr. Dwayne Estes. Yes. And, uh, and additionally, a lot of those plants are new species that they have yet to be identified. Yeah. They even, uh, Sam was saying that he, he heard, uh, Dr. Estes described as like, as County Record Estes, <laughs> which <laughs> is a nickname I'm going to pull out next time I see him. So <laughs> I think that's a, because we were, I was even mentioning, I'm like, man, the amount of new species he seems to find is staggering. Yeah. Uh, either him or someone else on that, that Southeastern Glass, Grasslands Initiative team, uh, excuse me, Institute, no, Institute team. Um, they just seem to find so many county records down there. Uh, it makes me want to go out there and, try and figure out what some of these plants are walking yeah. around and see if I can find some county records. Now, we, so. we did get a sneak peek at, at they just planted the fern trial. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, man, it's just amazing to me the amount of ferns, different yeah. ferns. Did uh, they say 64 different yeah. species or cultivars of, of fern. native ferns yeah. there? Which was amazing. Um, and we got to see the oak leaf hydrangea. Trials, yeah. which yeah. I'm a I'm a huge fan of that plant, and just seeing some of them. Uh, they had another a Tiarella trial that was yes. going on, um, which uh, primarily cultivars of Tiarella portifolia. Yeah, but uh, but that was just it's again not a plant that's uh, well. I guess Tiarella portifolia is it's pretty is popular native yeah. it, yes. in our area. It's but there's so many cultivars that are the ones that. Are more co commonly found. You you well, will see foam flower at Bowman Hill Wildflower Preserve. You know, and that's another place Tom and I love. Yeah, we're saying Mount Cuba, just because it's only been open to the public twenty years, maybe. Yeah, maybe that. Um, but they had worked. At the, this was always the plan for. Yes. Um, yeah. By the Copelands for 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 decades. So you're. It's it's almost like seeing Bowman's Hill on steroids. Yeah. You know, it's just the maturity of some of these plantings. I, I will put in a little editor's note here and say, Santino, don't worry. Don't get jealous. Of, of yeah. Mount Cuba. We plan on doing a similar type episode when we come and visit you <laughs> yeah. all the way back. Yes. Um, so we're just, we'll, you'll get your shine. <laughs> we just need to come and see you first. <laughs> but, but no, both in different different zones and, and Bowman's Hill is that natural area of, of what it is, yeah. and it's uh, both stellar. Both uh, we recommend both. It just different experiences yeah. for something oh, yeah. very somewhat similar. Probably equally hilly. Yes. But, uh, yes. Yeah. It was just very cool to see so many neat things today, and to get so excited about so many plants that I don't often think about when I think about mm -hmm. native plants. Um, and such great people to yeah. doing doing yeah. very important work. Um, I can't thank them enough for spending the day with us today, the amount of time they spent. And uh, we had some really good conversations. Yeah, it was. it's just, uh, it's fun to talk with other native plant people about um, not just native plants, but also like the, uh, the attributing or I shouldn't say attributing is an, is that even a word? I think so. It's got to yeah. be a word. It's not the word I'm trying to use. Um, I don't know what word I'm trying to use. The other issues that kind of surround native plants, um, whether it's uh, it's the the opinions about native plants and cultivars and and um, and some of the the criticisms about like some well, there's criticisms about what's going on at Mount Cuba. And, uh, and, and like, kind of 
no like I one's alluded free. to how I used to yeah. feel. Yeah. And I think there's still people that feel that way. No one's free of criticism. Yeah. And it's amazing for what they're what they're doing and the work they're doing, how many people that are purists are upset with the work mm-hmm. that they're doing or how you know, one of the conversations that we had, and this is something that Tom and I have had with numerous people on the podcast, outside of the podcast, is just for the sake of everything, how narrow is too narrow. We talked about people that when they have communities that are, if something's extirpated or close to being extirpated, that they would rather see it disappear than have outside genetics interfere. Yeah. Like, uh, I would, yeah, the outside genetics, that mindset is the outside genetics pollute the, the, speed or the the local population and, and you can't lessen it. That, yeah so if you can't preserve so, that let it go yeah which is just mind-boggling to me yeah i i can understand the argument but i don't necessarily agree with yeah. the sentiment yes um i think the the keeping the species is more important than preserving the genetics but i could probably be convinced I think it's probably on a case by case basis. I could probably be convinced to take up the other position. Um, this would be a great take it or leave. Oh, it. Yeah, I think we're doing it right now. I think we are. Too. <laughs> but I, 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 well, even in the conversations, I'm talking about uh, another guest we had, uh, one of our friends, Dr. Mil DeVito. And um, I know there's some species he's really passionate about. Hey, we need to save this species and let's get it in the hands of the the horticulture industry and, and have them grow more so we can bring it back. And there's other species where he's like, hey, we, we don't want to touch this. Yeah. Uh, I'm this, not even like, telling you where it's I'm at. Not, yeah, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to show you. This is such a special population of plants. We don't need it to be trifled with. And, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, we don't want to, if it's going to, if it's going to fade away, we, it's going to, we need to let it fade away. And, um, like I'm saying, yeah, I think I could be convinced on a case by case basis that there are plants that we need to let that happen. Well, I, I, I think to a certain degree, a, a, a certain degree, I do agree because some plants are just rare. Yeah, they're not meant to be overly populated because mm-hmm. that's not how they exist in nature. Yeah. some things are just more rare in nature. So if they're surviving. Where, you know, if it if they're not surviving because of our impact, you need to change that. Mm-hmm. But we don't need to interfere. They'll survive if we allow them to survive. Yeah. But some things aren't going to survive without our intervention. Yes. And that's, yes. I guess that's a hard decision to make or a case-by-case decision, like which ones those are. Yeah, there was a, a similar thing happened with, I don't remember what species it was. I think it was some kind of like, ferret or weasel okay. uh, in somewhere in the like the sagebrush area i think i don't remember the exact details but it was something where um it was an increasingly rare species of mammal and then um they tried to like captively breed it and release it and it ended up just being a total flop none of them survived and they thought the species went extinct and then all of a sudden, like some farm dog brought one back to its owner and he just had the sense to say, hey, this is something I haven't seen before. I'm going to call like a fishing game agent. And then the fishing game agent like, yeah, this might be this species that we haven't seen in a long time and like 20 some years or 30 some years. And then uh, ran it up the chain and eventually said, oh, yeah, this was one of those species. So your dog either found a dead one or killed one. Um, so it means that it must not be extinct. There must be more. And I think they were looking at doing this, um, the same course of action. They were going to try and captively rear some and then re-release them to the wild. But they were using like different, uh, a slightly different approach to do that. And, um, but like, yeah, there's going to be situations where it's like, oh, it's, we screwed up. It's not going to work. Maybe it's just time to let it fade away. And, you know, we've, We've intervened in many instances when we probably shouldn't have, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's when we talk about uh, 
when we had Perry Sassnett on from the Headwaters podcast, and mm-hmm. they talked about trying to save the white bark pine and what would be a host for this certain uh, pest that yeah. they ripped out all the current and then realized, oh yeah, it's not just current; it's other things. <laughs> yeah, yep. we've we've been at hand for. I mean, the government handed out multiflora rose and kudzu, kudzu and uh, ragosa rose and. <laughs> all kinds of stuff. There, there's plenty of things that the government are like, you use this. This is perfect. Yep. So yep. Um, obviously we know our capabilities of messing things up. Um, but I think at least we're we're talking about it in the right vein of how yeah. we can help. What's the best way to help? Yeah. That's and that's one of the things. And I think it's a little different when you get into invasives versus native species. I'm thinking about uh, something that's on a lot of people's minds here in the mid-Atlantic um, and that being spotted lanternfly and uh, and the well you have two or one solution right now yeah. and that is just almost indiscriminately spray and um, and that's like that's a, the, the only course of action being pushed by like New Jersey Department of Agriculture right now and um because it's really the only course of action we have other than doing nothing. And Actually, um, you know what? The uh, My wife and I were were taking a walk in, in mm-hmm. uh, Campy County Park over yeah. the weekend, and they had uh, traps out. Yeah, yeah. Which I was impressed. I didn't see a whole lot in them. Yeah, and, well, and the traps tend to be for more like a census of how bad things yeah. are. Yeah. Um, and they'll have the, the tree rings, the, like, the sticky rings, which that traps a lot of other things too and um there's some using trap trees but it seems like the spot of landfly has kind of moved to uh to some other stuff uh now like some native species as well yeah. so oh, the tree of heaven being a trap tree isn't as effective as it used to be because they'll use other species now i'm, I'm having a casey clap moment here where i'm telling a very <laughs> long roundabout story <laughs> to say one of the things that they're looking and this is right out of the Rutgers, uh, Alampi, insect lab um where they're looking at uh biological controls and they have some of basically what was uh i think it's a type of a species of wasp that in china is it china where the spot of land flies from uh, it, a korea i think well, no, I think they have some issues with it okay. in korea i think it's from china okay. um there's a, a parasitic wasp that will basically kill these things and now they're saying Oh well, what if we take this wasp and release it here, maybe that'll have a biological control. And I don't know. To me, it's another one of those issues. It's like, what if it, that becomes the, a bigger issue than? Yeah. The, what if that attacks all these native insects yeah. and out competes them? Like, like honeybees can out compete, you know, bumblebees. Yeah. You know, it's. I don't know. I find maybe maybe you bring them over and they're even a more horrible. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been. Rest. Uh, it, when it comes to spotted lanternfly, I haven't been in an area where there were that many where it was a nuisance. But I've heard of people who, I think, friend, you've been in that kind of situation oh, before. I, my son's freshman uh, year of college played lacrosse in Upper Bucks County in the fall. And it was like the second year in which, like, it was a year after I'd first heard of yeah. spotted lanternfly. And they were like, swarms of gnats like people were literally swatting them down the bleachers were covered like yeah. handfuls of spotted lanternfly and you could see them running through the grass and climbing through the trees the kids were swatting them out of their face while they were playing lacrosse it was a i'd never seen anything like it like i made sure when i drove out of that parking lot that there were no spotted lanternflies on my vehicle oh, yeah. i checked yeah. and checked and checked um but even this year on my virginia rose at home I counted at least somewhere between 30 to 50 mm-hmm. uh, in their first INSAR stage just on that plant. Yeah. And, and that scared me. And what's interesting is, um, like, oh, I guess what I was saying is I haven't, I haven't experienced it as a quality of life issue, but I have heard it being quality of life issue in other areas. But uh, for me, when I, I look at it, and uh, we haven't seen a lot in our area in that instar state or that nymph stage this year and um like is it worth it to to just kind of again 
go into an area where we see a, a big population kind of indiscriminately spray. And I think it is they're trying to target as best they can, yeah. but it's impossible to just target when you spray that way. Um, and, and then knowing that they're also like 20, 30 feet up in the trees where you're not getting the spray and think about everything else that's getting killed by that, that spray as well. All the other insect life, just to control something for the, the, the crop uh, damage hasn't, from what I've read and what I've heard, hasn't been as significant as they originally thought it could be, um, at least in most areas. And, and you brought up a good point. Like, they're more prevalent up high than they are down low. I was oh, at yeah. Bowman's Tower, uh, up in the, like, when you're on the ground, we had a picnic, we saw nothing. You go up yep. to the tower, they were all over at that height. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I it not... really clicked to me. Like that was when I was like, "Hey, we got we have to nuke these things. They're they're a nuisance. They're an issue. We need to get rid of them." I went out hunting one night. I'm 20 feet up in a silver maple. I had seen like two or three all day, and now I'm like I said, 20 feet up in the silver maple. I'm like, "Oh, there are hundreds up here." Yeah. This, okay, how? No, I mean, and I'm not in the. I'm in the uh, a wild area, or uh, I don't want to call it a natural area, but I'll say a wild area. And it's like, these aren't getting sprayed. Well, who's going to come and spray these? Yeah. So we're going to spray all these other areas. They're still going to be here and laying eggs, and then it's just going to be an issue next year. And so we're killing all this other – we have so much uh, bycatch, in a sense. And for what? It, it just, like, so we can say we did something? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it outweighs the, – the pros outweigh the cons in that scenario. And I don't know if I, – I don't know enough about – what's going on with the, the biological control research, but I just, I don't know. I, I get a little queasy when I think about that kind of stuff. Um, I think it could be effective, but it, uh, I think of Jurassic Park. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Oh, is this the right, the right maneuver or um, are we over, are we over addressing the issue? Is it, I, again, it's hard for me to say because I haven't experienced those quality of life instances yeah. where it's like oh this is really bad yeah. um like you can't be outside bad uh and we haven't had the winters to control them we we no. only had what three days in a row under under freezing this past winter, yeah four days? It, was, it, was, it wasn't very bad. in a row like there were other days like one here one there but i think the most extended mm -hmm. period we had were three days and i think they say you need two weeks of extended yeah. uh below freezing temperature to, to make an effect on the eggs so I'm thinking yeah. this is probably a good time to, we're just about home. Yeah. Oh, we're yeah. just about at an hour. Probably a good time to wrap it up. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, big takeaways. And I somehow we started talking a lot about spotted lanternfly. That's all me. That's all, that's my <laughs> fault. Um, we haven't seen many other out of state license plates once we no. got into New Jersey. Um, which makes sense. Not yes. a lot of people want to come here, <laughs> except if they're, if they're going to our beaches. Yeah, that's true. But, um, but yeah, big takeaway is, if you're coming to this area, uh, check out Mount Cuba Center, check out Bowman's Hill, check out uh, Longwood Gardens, um, but especially for native plant folks, check out Mount Cuba Center. Uh, and as I alluded to before, it is worth it to plan a trip um, with Mount Cuba Center being kind of the, the central topic. So, and I'm going to come here because I want to see this. Yes. But I'm going to check out all the other cool stuff in the area, too. Very true. It is, it is definitely a worthwhile place to go. Um, that's, again, my, my big takeaway here. I agree with you. I have nothing to add to that. Yeah. I think there's, there's enough there to keep you occupied and fun. There's a lot of great breweries and wineries, too. So you can add that into your trip and uh, make it, you know, don't make an excuse. Just use that as your central focus yeah so that's gonna wrap it up for the or wrap us up for today uh fran is gonna be in uh in beautiful croatia and i'm yes. gonna be heading out to maine so um and depending on when this gets released one of us will be on vacation um <laughs> so yeah like that's gonna wrap us up for today we really hope you've enjoyed listening to this special edition of native plants healthy planet and uh and take a trip to mount cuba center in your future um I think this is your part now. Yeah, so I we're going to say thank you to Andorra for our theme music. Uh, I don't know. We had some submissions for the Native Plant Anthem at this point. I don't know who is going yeah, to win. At the point where we're, 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 uh, we got two submissions today, 
Yeah. At the point we're recording this, but the contest isn't over at this point. Yeah. So, so we we can't play. So it. we can't. We don't know we who don't know won yet, but it's it, going to be one of one of a few. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook at Pinelands Nursery and J. You can follow us on Instagram at Native Plants underscore Healthy Planet, and you can follow us on YouTube at uh, Pinelands Nursery. You should definitely call the uh, the question and comment line, which I don't remember what that number is, but it's a 215 area code, and it will be in the show notes. And uh, call and leave a, a question or a comment. We'll do our best to play it on a future episode of The Buzz. And thank you to all the members of the Native Plants uh, Healthy Planet Facebook group. We've, we've actually gotten our first blue check member. We uh, have, yeah, we have, yeah. We have, Very so. exciting. And hopefully a future podcast guest, too. Yes, I agree. So, yeah. So, like I usually tell you at the end of all our episodes, you can go to our website, which is www.nativeplantshealthyplant.com, and check buy merch there, basically. Uh, we have a couple different t-shirt designs. We have iPhone cases, Android cases, you know, and aprons, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then we don't keep any of that money. The, the, the t-shirt producer takes their cut. Yeah. And then the rest goes into a PayPal account. And once that PayPal account gets up to a certain number, uh, an undetermined number for us, we kind of take it and whoever kind of has, has, uh, hit us at the right moment, we say, Hey, you want this money? You're doing good <laughs> stuff with native plants. We think you deserve it more than we do. They always say yes. And they always say yes. <laughs> so we haven't had anyone say no yet. And then we, we make that donation to them um, because we don't think we should be the ones making money off the, the native plant stuff, um, at least at this point. Um, maybe, if it were, maybe if it was a huge, huge sums of money, we'd have second thoughts. I would say but, yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, it's a way we wanted to... The whole idea behind it is we don't need this money. We want to give it to people who it's going to make a big difference to. Um, so usually the people we choose are smaller organizations that uh, a couple hundred bucks is going to go a long way in helping them accomplish their mission. Um, because we need more and more of those kind of groups. Those small groups are going to have really good, like strong local impact in their area. So uh, you can also listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet. Uh, really, wherever you're listening to right now, that's where you can listen to it. Uh, but if you're telling a friend, you can tell them they can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, really wherever they their, their favorite podcast platform. And uh, also tell them they got to hit subscribe. Yeah. If they aren't subscribed to our show, uh, well, make them subscribe. I don't know what else to say. They should subscribe <laughs> if they don't haven't already. I'm sure so many of you are. and. If it's possible on your platform, leave a five-star review. If you do a little write-up with the review, I give you a shout-out on our Buzz episodes and uh, and just kind of thank you for, for leaving some kind words for Fran and I to blush over. So with that, everyone, thank you. I'm Tom. And I am Fran, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that next episode is going to be a best of. We'll play this first, and then the best of is going yeah. to be... Claudia West and Benjamin Vogt, two authors that we've had on uh, early in the podcast that we can uh, share with everyone. So make sure you tune into that. We'll be back from vacation the week after that. Uh, and we can tell you about all of our adventures and uh, until yeah, all then, our cool native plant yeah. finds there. That's one of the things I do like about Maine is they have a whole different native, it's a lot of similar native plants too, but a whole different native plant palette for me to check out. So. I'm going to see plants that I won't even know if they're yeah. native to the area that I'm in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so make sure wouldn't, you... Wouldn't it be funny if you see a whole bunch of, like, one native plants from here? Pur over purple there? Dome Master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pur Purple Dome Master and, and all this stuff. Like, wow, it's like I'm at home. <laughs> uh, so make sure you tune in, and until then, keep it native. So tall, these buzz about sipping left and fall. Oh, native plants, how you grace this 
To the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.